find that this is the time of function. If I were to look at the diagonal, right, which goes from 0, 0, 0 to 255, 255, 255, that's the line of grains. Right? Because that's the line on which you have equal amounts of all the three values. And basically that is your going from black to white. That's all shades of grain. That's what a color space is, and that particular diagonal axis that you have is your luminance axis. Okay. Now, if you want to go from there to a CMI space, keep in mind it's a subtractive space, right? So, being a subtractive space, the way you compute CMI is nothing but, you look at the max value of RG and E that you have, and you take the corresponding value, subtract so that gives you an equivalent representation of CMI. Now, in general, of course, to, to do complete reproduction of all the colors, you have to have black channel as well. Right? So you, you have to add black into the mix. That's why typically you have the CM by K representation. Now, there are other spaces. Uh, for example, there's a YIQ space, right, which is also used commonly where I, Y is your luminance value. I is actually red minus the sine value. And Q is the magenta minus the green value. Okay, so that's the another representation. And typically the transformation defined for the YIQ representation is given by this P by P matrix. Okay. So I can go from my RGB values into this YIQ value. Now these values, the reason they exist is because this is what typically is used for you know, your, your television and, and video transmission uh, signals and so on and so forth. So for NTSC coding and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, black and white, and we have black and white uh, visions, would actually use just the wire that would be enough to, to depict the corresponding grayscale representation of the underlying color signal. Okay. We, we don't really use YIQ color spaces all that much in computation today, uh, but that's where they came from. Now, some of the spaces that we actually use quite often in computational uh, use is one of them being the HLS space. Okay. An HLS space is basically uh, a Q luminance and saturation space. So the way it's computed is L is again the luminance value, so it's simply the R plus U plus P. S is your saturation, which is actually defined according to this particular equation. And then you have your uh, U value, which is given by T as a corresponding way of computing. But the intuitive notion of understanding the space is the fact that it's a conical space. Where in the center, the center of light of its own is basically a luminous space. Going from black to white. Within this cone, you have these circles. Each circle is nothing but every particular luminous value. It defines the colors. So the circle defines all the colors that I have. And the magnitude away from the center line on that circle defines the amount of uh, sorry, the saturation that I have for the color. Okay. So the circle will define the hue actually because I'm taking the color. And the amount of saturation for that color that I have. So if you are right in the center line, the saturation is going to be low, away from it is going to be hot. Okay. And that's what actually gives us a color representation. So now, uh, if I I'll show you what this uh, will look like in color. Of course, along the central line, you will not have any color. You don't see any color because all you see is shades of gray. As you move away from it, uh, you actually see changing saturation, so, you know, you actually see brightness in this. But also, along the angular direction of the circle, the color will change. Now, of course, how do we use these color values for processing purposes, right? Um, now, in general, when you get a color image, it's a vectorial image. Right? Every point has a vectorial color value. Um, and that will be dependent on the illumination conditions. Right? So, do we actually create models 
where we process these as vectors or do we process them as independent values? Right? And uh, well, the reality is that uh, it's, it's difficult uh, for us to, to pick one or the other. There is value in, in doing both. Uh, but in general, looking at raw RGB values may not be the solution we are looking for for color processing of digital images to start. And the reason being this. If I actually take an image with a flash, I will probably get this digital image. Now, of course, under a different light source, the same image will look very different. Now, if I treat these as either as vectorial RGB patterns, I may not be able to recover the same information that I get here, just as here. Uh, and so the question is, how do I ascertain with without having been dependent on the light source? some notion of the fact that this color is the same as this color. That's what eventually I want to do. If I want to do scene level processing, that's what I need. I need to somehow normalize the color that I see because of different illuminations, sources. Okay. So same, same thing happening here. With different light sources, things will appear different in terms of color. Okay. So knowing the real RGB value itself may not help me do interpretation of what's in the scene. Okay. So, of course, uh, scientifically, the best thing we can do is, is first calibrate our illuminant before we actually go and acquire an image. So, if I know and calibrate my illuminant, then I know how to actually transform my RGB values so that everything appears in some normalized way. So remember, if I know my luminant curve and I get my output, I can normalize everything and say, well, I can deconvolve my output values with my input transfer and response function and get back my some normalized reflectance curve. Right? So if I have that, then it doesn't matter where I am, it should appear the same for the same option. Well, that would be great, but we can't probably do that all the time. Right? If I could, that's what I would do. Now, in reality, I, I still have to just deal with, in most cases, images that I get. And in some cases, uh, uh, you know, grayscale images or vectorial color images. So for color images, I can choose one of two types of processing. One, what I typically refer as marginal processing, or the other is a vectorial processing. Marginal processing being where I just treat each one separately, independently. I process all three, get some result, and come out combine the result in order to make some interpretation. Or I can do vectorial processing, right? Uh, so this is marginal processing. I, I have some process that is a scalar process. I get the result and move on. Or I can do a vectorial processing where I combine the three and treat it as a vector and then get some result uh, as a vector. Now there's problems uh, associated with what may consider we may consider false coloring, right? So let's say that uh, I'm going to do some vectorial processing on this, and uh, the reality is that if I do vectorial processing, this image under a particular vectorial process may appear like this. Or if I were to process this image in a marginal form, it may appear like that, and the operation that I would look at would be a simple operation in me. If you want to do a medium filtering on this image and treat it as a marginal image, right, so I look at the corresponding red value, green value, blue value, compute the median filter result, right? So some three by three block, five by three block, whatever you want to choose, pick a median value at the location, independently for red, independent for green, independent for blue. I will end up with the filter image that looks like that, and you can kind of see that. Medium. If I were to do vectorial median, I would get that. And that's also distortion. It's not really what I want. Right? Make sense? So each one of them gives me a false color in my filtered image. And this is a very simple operation. So the question becomes, what do I do, right? If I if I do either marginal or vectorial processing, 
I may not get the right answer. So this is the actual example calculation. So if you have RGB values at a given location, and I simply look at the marginal median, this is what I get, right? So I compute the median of R separately, the median of green separately, and median of blue separately. So I get this value. If I do vectorial median, I just pick the middle value and I get 0, 100, 0. So obviously the results are not the same. They are different. Um, question being now, which one is the correct result? I don't know. I don't know. And chances are that neither are correct, of course, as you saw in the previous example, if my intent was to do filtering. So there are some problems. And as a result, RGB processing in its native form is probably not the appropriate way for us to process images. And we have to look at alternate color spaces. Okay? And the idea of looking at alternate color spaces would be the fact that you want to decorrelate the color channels. If you truly want to do marginal processing, you should do it within the fact that they're independent. And that way the marginalization makes sense. So I should generate a color space which is truly independent below the fact that all these that we get are not independent of each other. So maybe that's what I want to do. So we look at principal components of our I want to bring information uh, which actually makes sense in terms of perception models. Right? So I look at view, saturation, and brightness values and design color spaces based on that. And of course I want to ensure perception uniformity. Right? So when I actually look at these color spaces, I want to make sure that if I compare things, you know, they compare uniformly across the entire space of color. And I don't want to worry about where I am in order to compare this. Right. So we will look at some interesting color models and compare them to see which might be appropriate for us to use in, in terms of digital processing. Okay. We'll look at that next time. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any of this uh, that we've looked at today? Okay, very good. Well, um, so in that case, we can stop here for the day. Uh,